Okay, good evening. Tonight's topic, I named where there's a will, there's a way. Really? Is that true? Yes. I think many can relate to this topic, and the fact that next week is Pesach, Passover, is significant because this particular topic can certainly relate or connect to uh, the holiday of Pesach. Because what happened exactly on Passover? The main theme behind Passover is the redemption of the Jewish people. Coming out of exile and being a free people. But they're not actually free. They are committed to having a relationship with God and observing His commandments and not Pharaoh's commandments. There's a big difference. So everyone thinks about the redemption. Everybody's looking forward to the upcoming redemption, the big redemption, the biggest of all, when Mashiach comes and redeems actually the entire world. What people forget is there's also the concept of a, an individual redemption, where one can redeem himself from his personal troubles. So in talking about personal troubles, redeeming oneself from personal troubles, I am reminded of something called helplessness. And that is why I decided to talk about this topic, is because the world today is actually going through a lot of helplessness in different ways. And this helplessness is actually a sign that Mashiach is coming soon. As we have a tradition that when we reach a point, that we have on no one on who to rely except for our Father in Heaven, we will realize that the end of times is near. Helplessness is a terrible kind of feeling. This feeling of helplessness has been around throughout history. There were different times in our history where people have felt that way, felt miserable, felt that there is nothing that they can do. And they were willing to just give up, not knowing what else can they do to help themselves. One of the most recent times in recent history that there was such a feeling was during the Great Depression, which most of you don't recall because you're too young. But it was in 1929, beginning 1929, throughout the 1930s, up until World War II. And this Great Depression, even though it began in this country, it actually had an effect all over the world. It was a very, very difficult time to live in. And I know people who lived through it. It was very, very difficult. During that time, you had 12 million people who were out of work at one given time. 12 million people. You had 10,000 companies that went bankrupt. And you had thousands upon thousands of people who committed suicide. Now, even though suicide happens all the time, unfortunately, for different reasons, at that time, the numbers increased greatly. So the question is, how do we overcome such feelings of helplessness? How do we deal with the fears? How do we talk to someone? What do we say to him if he's struggling? Or how do we deal with failure in one's life? Can we really call it failure? So as you're gonna soon see, it's a problem with the interpretation that people have. What exactly are they experiencing? So, the way I describe it is having the wrong perception. And I very much recommend for one who would very much want to know more about the wrong perception is to see the video lecture on the eyes are the windows to the soul. Very important lecture. How what we see, how we interpret things can make a big difference in our life. So perception is very important. Perception of what life is. Perception of what true happiness is. A lot of people don't have the right ideas about what life is and what happiness is. I'll give you an example. Some people actually believe deep down that God made a mistake, that He gave somebody else billions of dollars and that individual is not using it right. I would have done a lot better, he says. He thinks he does. He thinks he would do better. So deep down what he's saying is, apparently God made a mistake. How come he gave 
that individual who's not the greatest individual, who doesn't use his money wisely, who per perhaps is a miser, how come he gave him billions of dollars? And here we have all these good people, righteous individuals, who are struggling. People who have this kind of distorted views eventually become very disappointed, angry, jealous, and this could lead to suicide too, having distorted views. What are they missing? What, is it, what are they missing from being able to enjoy life to its fullest? One example that I like to give is Disneyland. Imagine someone coming to Disneyland, looking forward to it. He was told this is a great experience. You can spend a whole day and not see everything there is. And it's a, a lifetime experience. It's really worth it, even though it may be expensive, you'll enjoy it very much. So he's looking forward to it. He's, he gets himself the ticket, takes his family. And what does he do with his time? Instead of going and enjoying the rides, the many, many rides, he goes and buys some cotton candy. He goes to eat lunch, goes to the restroom, looks around, buys something at the gift shop, right? And before you know it, they're, they're closing the gates. He's wasted his entire day on silly things. Uh, we obviously need to eat and drink, right? And go to the restroom occasionally. But that's not what you came to Disneyland for, right? You came to enjoy the rides. You paid an expensive ticket to go in and see what there is. And there's so much to see. You would have enjoyed it. You would have seen how fascinating it is. You would have marveled at what, what they put together there. Beautiful things. But he wasted his time on food and drink and <clears throat> talk and, and so forth. But that is exactly what happens with the human soul. They tell him before he comes down, there's a lot to see, there's a lot to accomplish. Be careful, don't waste your time. You're only given so many years to do so, to take a tour. And hopefully, you'll do something with that time that you're given. Don't waste it. Don't waste it on vanities and trivialities. Be careful. Emphasize what's really important. But before you know it, we're packing our bags and we're, we need to leave. And they don't give us the time to say goodbye sometimes. You know, when the time comes to leave, sometimes it happens suddenly. And you can't even say, wait, wait a minute, I, I haven't seen this and, I, and I'd like to see this and that. No, that's it. You had all the time in the world to do so, but you wasted your time on things that are not so important. I call that missed opportunities. There's a lot of times that people miss opportunities and you can't bring those back. So even though I gave the example of Disneyland, in real life not everything is a Disneyland because as you've heard the saying, life is not a bed of roses. But even though life is not a bed of roses, neither is it a bed of thorns. But there are thorns. So the question is, what are those thorns? There are beautiful roses, but what are those thorns? Those thorns are challenges. They're called challenges. It's important to keep that in mind. We face some sort of difficulty, we're experiencing some hardship. It's a challenge. Nothing more than that. But what for? Why should there be challenges? Well, for that you have to turn to Judaism. And Judaism sheds some light on what challenges are. For example, you remember Abraham? Abraham? He was tested by God. Now when we think of a test, it's because we want to find out something about someone. Is he loyal? Can I trust him? Will he do what I ask of him to do? That's a normal test that a human being needs to do when he's interviewing someone perhaps, when he wants to know if to hire someone. We test, we don't know. God doesn't need to test us, he knows exactly what we're all about. He reads our thoughts. Why should he test Abraham? It's a good question, right? And what's the answer? When God tests a human being, it's not to find out something about him. It's to elevate him. Had he not gone through the test, he would have stayed low. He would have been 
what he always was all along without ever growing, without ever becoming a better person, a stronger individual. So challenges build us, they elevate us spiritually. We're also rewarded for the challenges in the afterlife. But it's not just about the reward, it's about elevating the human being to greater heights through these challenges. But what I want to talk a little bit more about is how challenges are lessons. Lessons from which we can learn. Valuable lessons in life. And they're lessons all the time. Not everybody realizes, but they're lessons all the time for him to learn. Remember the Jewish people in the desert for 40 years? They were tested too. There's no water. They're thirsty. They're crying out to God. Let's go back to Egypt. They're complaining. There's a lot of complaints. Why? Why should you complain? You just saw God performing miracles. He just took you out of Egypt. But they're not used to this. Why should he hold back the water? He wants us to come to Israel. He wants us to be his nation. Then let him provide everything. They don't realize until the end, when Moses explains it then, all of these lessons, all of these hardships that you had, that Hashem made intentionally for you to have, are lessons in the future where you don't have me as your leader, when you don't hear the voice of God directly. What will you do and how will you react when you have no food on the table? Will you start complaining? Will you commit suicide, God forbid? Will you run away from your faith? I mean, what are you going to do? How are you going to react? How are you going to deal with it when you're many, many years removed from that experience that your forefathers had, who witnessed miracles? And you're not witnessing them openly. You just have this faith. How are you going to deal with the hardship? So we needed those lessons that when you do go through some sort of challenge, ask, pray, don't cry and complain. That's all. That's all you got to do. When you're dealing with a situation where you don't see a way out, just talk to him, pray to him. He actually may help you. <laughs> so that is some of the lessons that we needed to learn as we were becoming a nation, a people. We have no idea how God interacts with this world. Now, of course, after we hopefully have learned the Torah that we have, right? hopefully our faith has become strong and we have a better understanding of why certain things happen. We don't have complete clarity, but we do have a better understanding. You know, there was a, a rabbi once who was thrown into jail for something he never did wrong. He didn't commit a crime. And he was puzzled. Why did God allow them to throw him in jail? Did he commit some sin, a transgression? I mean, what, what is it? And they revealed to him, I think it was in a dream, you did nothing wrong, but we wanted you to be in jail so that you should learn a lesson. You should feel what it is to be in jail so that when you go out and raise money, you raise money for those people who are in prison and you work hard to get them out. We wanted you to feel what it is to be in jail. So you should experience this on your flesh and then you will be more committed to this because you will know what it's all about, what pain they're going through being away from their families and being treated in a subhuman way. We wanted you to feel it first and then you would work harder. Yes, he needed to learn this lesson too. How else would he know the pain of another individual unless he actually felt it himself? So one of the most important lessons that human beings need to learn is that they can actually affect change. It is possible sometimes to affect change in a given situation. It all depends what we're talking about. There is a famous Brazilian novelist by the name of Paulo Coelho who says as follows, There's only one thing that makes a dream impossible to achieve. The fear of failure. I don't completely agree with him because there are more things that actually make it difficult for a person to achieve. But this is true that one of them is the fear of failure. So where do we begin? How do we begin to affect change? Now besides Salanter, famous rabbi in the, the 19th century, the leader of the Musa movement, Jewish ethics, incredible 
personality. He says as follows, Man is free in his imagination, but bound by his reason. Imagination, you're free to imagine anything you want. People imagine they're flying. People imagine all kinds of things. You're free in your imagination, but you're bound. You're limited in your reason, the intellect, the mind. There are things that we realize with our mind that are simply not realistic. So the intellect, the reason tells us this is possible, this is not possible. But you're welcome to imagine because the imagination is free. Free to imagine anything it wishes. What's the significance of this? Why imagine? Imagination really is the seed, the thought, the first step to doing anything. You have to want something, you have to think about it, you have to imagine it. When you plant a seed, it's something so small and appears to be insignificant, but you know that that seed can become a tall sequoia or redwood tree. It may take a while. From a little seed, an incredible tree, an incredible tall tree, yes, from a seed. How does it start? From a thought, from your imagination. Now, even though potentially this can happen, that with one's imagination and with one's good thoughts, obviously not bad thoughts, one can actually accomplish a lot. He can't do everything, he can't do anything he wants. Why? Because Judaism reminds us that one of the limitations to doing what we would like to do is mazal. If one's destiny or fate does not permit for it, then it won't happen. Or as the verse says, Many are the thoughts of man, but it's the will of God that will come true. In other words, if Hashem does not want something for us, because He knows it's not good for us, then He won't allow us to have it or to do it. So man is limited for a variety of reasons. He can't just do anything he wants. And we're not going to talk too much about those areas because it's not within our control. If it's beyond our control, in other words, if it's in the hand of Hashem, there's very little we can do. There's still something we can do. But what's more important is that area where we actually can do something, where we actually can affect the change. Rabbis tell us, for example, that God has certain keys, maftechot, the key to rain, to livelihood, to children. Which woman will have children? Some women don't have children. Who will live, who will die? The keys are in his hands. And what I would like to add, that there's one key that we have, and I call it the master key. Imagine, this is a master key. What's a master key? It opens up all the doors. And what's the master key? Simcha, happiness. Happiness is a very important key because it can actually open up all the gates that may have been locked otherwise. Happiness. But when I say happiness, I don't necessarily mean someone who's happy and joyous and content. Happiness on a simplistic level just means optimism. So even though, of course, when we say happiness, we mean to be happy, to be content. But remember, for now, what I'm saying by happiness means optimism. Winston Churchill, you may have heard of him, <laughs> he has many sayings. One of his sayings is about optimism, and he says it as follows. The pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. He's a pessimist. The optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. Mm -hmm. In other words, if a difficulty presents itself, maybe there's an opportunity here. That's the optimist. Judaism, however, reminds us that in order to be a true optimist, you have to believe that I call it tova. Everything is for the good. Otherwise, you'll have a problem being an optimist. Everything that Hashem does is for some good. We may not be aware of it right now. Maybe later on we will see what good came out of it. All we see is something that's terrible. We can't figure this out. I'm reminded by 
the famous story that happened with the Chazonish, great rabbi, who in his last years lived in Israel. And this is after World War II. A Holocaust survivor came to him, Rabbi, how could God do this? How could he do this? Six million Jews perished. What's the explanation for it, Rabbi? So the Rabbi tells him, let me give you an example through which you will possibly understand a little bit. There was one somebody who brought some very, very expensive and fine wool to the tailor for him to make a suit. So he brings in the merchandise, the tailor tells him, you know, it will be ready in a couple weeks. All right. This man wanted to check up on the tailor how he's doing, and the following day he sees that his entire wool, several yards of wool, is cut up into pieces. And he complains, he says, what do you do to my expensive, beautiful wool? You cut it up into pieces. And the tailor tells him, sir, please, come back in two weeks and you will see what I made from these pieces. <laughs> right now you see pieces. Just come back and see the finished suit. What we see right now, God forbid, unfortunately, it's very, very sad, are pieces. A lot of people who lost their life. We don't understand what the grand tailor is making. Let's come back a few years from now when Mashiach comes then we will realize what Hashem has made with all that. So right now, we're limited in our understanding. And that is what Judaism emphasizes. Remember, at all times, nothing bad comes down from above. It's all good for some ultimate good. We don't always understand what that good is right now, but eventually we will. Therefore, your attitude should be Gamzulatova, even though something just terrible happened to you that is not your fault. Obviously, if people commit a crime, it's their fault. I'm not talking about that. Something which is not in your control, something which is not your fault, is for some good. That is an important way to look at things. But what about those things that we do have some control? It's important to remember that many people, many, many people, Jews and non-Jews alike, have had many, many challenges in their life, many difficulties that they had to overcome. And they succeeded, and they become very, very famous. I'm just going to mention three that comes to my mind that are famous, that had very, very big challenges, and nonetheless, they succeeded. One of them was Beethoven, who towards the end of his life was becoming deaf. He was losing his hearing gradually, and still he went on to compose. And that's incredible, he didn't give up. He made important compositions, even at that stage. Of course, there's a difference between the time he was able to hear well versus the time he couldn't hear so well. But still, he continued. And despite that impediment, he succeeded. Then you have the famous Helen Keller. She was deaf and blind. Also contributed immensely in teaching people with disabilities that they can also succeed. Another example that I recall is Franklin Roosevelt, the president, one of the presidents of the United States, who suffered from polio earlier on, went on to become governor and then president for more terms than anybody else. And he actually succeeded in this position as president. There are many individuals like that who didn't just give up because of some difficulty or some challenge that they had. Here's another one, Thomas Edison. <laughs> this one is funny. He's a very interesting individual, Thomas Edison. You know, one of the things that he discovered was the light bulb. And he failed so many times to figure it out how to do it right. He finally got it right. So he once talked about it. He says, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> but I didn't fail. He looked forward to figuring this out despite those apparent failures, despite the difficulties that he had. He didn't give up. He tried and tried and eventually he succeeded. 
One of my favorite stories, however, is with a great rabbi by the name of the Netziv, also who lived in the past century, 19th century. As a little child, he was going to school and he was not really doing that well scholastically. And the teacher once came over to the parents one evening. They thought that the child was asleep, so they spoke openly. And he tells the parents, you know, it's a waste for your son to continue in school, learning the Talmud and all the difficult subjects. He's better off becoming an apprentice somewhere. You know, in those days there was an apprentice. Instead of trade school, they went to learn a trade at someone's shop. Let him become an apprentice, let him learn a trade, a profession, at least he will be able to provide for his family. This will be more satisfying for him and hopefully he will learn a trade that will be able to help him in life. The parents were almost convinced, it made sense to them, but he overheard the whole conversation and as soon as the rabbi and the teacher left, he ran out of his room and he cried to the parents and says, I want to learn Torah. I don't want to become an apprentice. I don't want to go to work right now. I really want to study Torah. I want to become learned in Torah. Please give me a chance. Okay, the parents said, you really very much want to learn Torah? We'll give you a chance. I don't think he slept too much that night. When the parents went to sleep, he began to pray and cry. This is a child. God, please give me the brains. Enable me to be able to understand the Torah. This is all that I want. And guess what happened? The day after that, not a month or a year later, the day after, all of a sudden, he became more receptive to the learning and he succeeded. He was able to achieve a lot to the point where he became a great leader. Not just a learned Jew, but a great leader amongst the Jewish people. When he published one of his famous books in the introduction, he writes, Imagine if I would head to heaven after I departed from this world and they would show me a book and I would ask who wrote this book and they would, have, they would have told me it's you and I would have said I never wrote that book and they would say this is a book that you could have written had you immersed yourself, had you tried harder, this is what you would have accomplished, this is your book. I would have been embarrassed if they would show me that. Thank God that now I am publishing my book, I realize, look, look what I accomplished. Had I not begged and cried, this would not have happened. There are all kinds of individuals who grew up in all kinds of difficult situations, some in poverty, and they became very, very wealthy and very successful. And despite the odds, they overcame they overcame all the challenges that they faced. So even though, I repeat, a lot of it is mazal, a great deal of people's success has to do with what their mazal is. Nonetheless, there are some areas in life where we can actually affect change. It depends on our attitude, it depends on our outlook, it depends on how we relate to it, if we're serious or not. So what I want to emphasize right now is that there's certain things that will make progress more difficult that we have to be aware of. Number one is depression. If someone is sad, depressed, disappointed, these are terrible feelings that can lead to suicide even sometimes. You want to avoid these things. Look for a way to deal with it properly. Don't just sink into depression and look at yourself as a failure. Who says? There are a lot of people who are worse off than you. A lot of people who went through similar situations and came out of it, came out ahead. And by the way, even those who did succeed and made a lot of money, became famous. Who says they're happy? Money is not what's going to determine if someone's going to be happy. These people who have lots of money could be in pain, miserable, divorced three times. Yes, many of people like that. So what, what are they missing? They made it in life, right? They became famous movie stars or famous for, for some other reason. Then how come they're not happy? What people forget is that there are many forces out there, many challenges. We spoke about them before. 
challenges of all kinds. And many, many times, these challenges can become unbearable for an individual who does not have God in his life. If you don't believe in a God that controls everything, to whom you can speak, to whom you can relate your problems, that he actually can make a change in your mazal, if you don't have that belief of possibility in miracles and things changing for the good, then it's going to be a lot tougher. So it's, it's not enough just to make it in life, it's to be successful and to be famous. That will not be enough because there's so many forces out there and challenges that can make sometimes one feel it's just unbearable. How do I escape this? How do I deal with this? The money didn't help him. That is why the verse says in Mishlei, Sheva yipol tzadik v'kam. Sheva. Seven times a righteous man can fall. Seven times and still he rises. Imagine falling seven times, but the righteous man falls and he rises. He doesn't give up. He fell many times. He believes that Hashem can help him. Perhaps next time I won't fall. So, even those who do have faith, believing God, have their challenges too. They're not always strong. Much will depend on their outlook, how they see life, how they see this challenge. What is this all about? I'll give you an example of having the right perspective. A small example of, of how seeing things in the right light will make a difference. I just went to a shop and one of the vendors behind the counter was Jewish and he was helping me and then he tells me with, with sadness in his eyes, I have no choice, I have to do this, I have to take this job to pay my rent. And I tell him, why are you sad? You should be happy. You know what you're doing in this job? You're helping people. You're helping me choose the right product. You're helping people all the time in this particular job. There's nothing to be sad of. And that brought, of course, a smile to his face. Yes, he says, wow, I didn't think of that. I says, of course, it's obvious. That's what Hashem wants you to have right now. But don't look at it as uh, you're doing a menial job, you have no choice. This is good, because you're helping people. Isn't that special to help people? You're helping in this capacity, somebody else is helping in some other capacity. But you're helping people, don't be sad. Okay, that's areas where we can affect change, how we see things. But what about that which is impossible, or it appears to be impossible? Well, I'm sure you've seen or you've heard of miracles. Miracles do occur. Miracles happen all the time. So even though something appears impossible, a woman is told by the doctor she can't have children, or her husband is told that, don't say it's impossible. It's difficult, it's challenging, but miracles do occur. It's important to have that attitude, that perspective, otherwise people give up very quickly. If you don't have that belief, it's much more difficult. In business matters, people have lost money too. Now what? What do, we, what do we say to him? What we say to him is the famous saying, you win some and you lose some. That's true. Who says you're always going to win? You win some and you lose some. That's the right attitude. It's all for the good. It's all part of the mazal perhaps. There's a reason for it. It's not the end of the world. Money comes, money goes. Health is much more important than the money, right? Are you healthy? Yeah, thank God. Well, be happy with that. Okay, so there's a, a way to look at it properly. Don't ever allow yourself to sink into depression because of money, even though it could be very painful, very challenging. If someone is having a hard time making a living, there are worse things. And this is only temporary, hopefully. Health? God forbid sometimes, can be with one for many, many years, if not for the rest of his life. Which one would you prefer? <laughs> would you like to exchange? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Important perspective or outlook and how we see things. However, 
When it comes to spiritual matters, in that area the rabbis tell us, Abali Tahir one who wants to be pure, he wants to be righteous, he will receive divine assistance automatically almost. What does that mean? God, please help me be a better father, a better husband, to be more successful in understanding the Torah that I'm learning, because I have it, I have a hard time figuring it out. Anytime, anytime you ask for something spiritual, a mitzvah, there's a better chance that Hashem will answer your prayers because it's spiritual, it's not physical. If you ask to win the lottery, you're not going to get it necessarily because Hashem says, I don't want you to win the lottery because it may destroy your life as it has many people's lives. I know what's good for you. But when it comes to something spiritual, I just want to be a better person. Help me control my anger. Oh, yes. As long as you try. You have to, of course, try too. Hashem will help. Hashem will send you the right teachers, the right uh, uh, lectures, perhaps, to listen to, books, material. So when we ask for something that's spiritual in nature, that is a good thing, we will receive divine assistance. And that is what the rabbis tell us further. In the path man chooses to go, they will lead him. What does that mean? If it's pure to become a better person, they will actually assist him, not only lead him, but assist him. But But if he wants to become tame, impure, and do the wrong thing, they'll just open the door for him. They won't push him in. They won't lead him there, God forbid. You want to be a criminal? You want to do something wrong? You want to commit a terrible sin? They won't lead you there, God forbid, of course not. But they'll open the door. In other words, they won't stop you. So man chooses to some extent the way that he wants to lead in his life. What kind of a, a marriage does he want to have? What kind of a parent does he want to be? What kind of a friend? What kind of a partner? How much charity does he want to do? All of this is completely free will. Now, when you give charity, you also have the free will of, of how you do it. With a smile, or do you tell the guy you just helped, next time go get yourself a job, instead of knocking on people's doors. You just committed a terrible sin. You got no mitzvah out of this. It would have been better not to give him the charity and say those terrible, abusive words. You have to be careful how to treat people. All of that is up to us. So in areas that are spiritual, Hashem wants to help us, but we need to make an effort, we need to ask for His help. In that area, Hashem will help. What about someone who's completely frustrated? He's tried, nothing helps. He's really tried. He's frustrated that every time he tries, he fails. Let me tell you a story and you will understand what I mean. There was once an individual that came to a great rabbi and told him, Rabbi, the evil inclination just overpowers me. And I always succumb. And I can't control myself, you know, and I, I'm frustrated. I've tried. So the Rabbi asked him, tell me, tell me the truth. Do you ever win the battle against the evil inclination? Mm -hmm. Or do you always lose? No, sometimes I win. Sometimes I resist. Sometimes I actually have the upper hand. Good. Thank God that you don't always lose. Then you would be in terrible shape. If you sometimes win, that's great. Be happy. Be proud that you've done something beautiful. Something which is not easy. Right? To defeat the evil inclination, to resist temptations and pressures, to do the right thing, to not to succumb to do the wrong thing, to take a bribe or to do something worse. So if you sometimes win, that's good. It shows that you have a potential to succeed. If you're always losing, that's not a good sign. So even if someone is frustrated, measure your successes and don't just focus on your failures. Rabbis tell us that one of the biggest failures, however, is not working hard enough on refining a particular midah. People have all kinds of characteristics, strengths and weaknesses. And it's not easy to change. We can't really change who we are, but we can control it. Right? Somebody who's stingy by nature can learn to be a giver. He can train himself. He can get into the habit of giving. 
one who is an angry person, a temperamental person, can train himself to hold back and to shut his mouth. It's difficult, very difficult. But he can train himself. So you're not going to completely change your nature, but you can control it. So the rabbis tell us, if you don't succeed in refining at least one of characteristics, then you really haven't accomplished anything in life. Because a lot of what people acquire in life, whether it's a wife and children and wealth, all of this is from Shammai from heaven. They can hopefully send you that. We all have a soulmate. God willing, the two will be able to have children together. God willing, they'll have a decent job and earn a decent living. But what about character? What about human relationships? Be careful that you are not the slave and that you are always the master, the slave of the evil inclination. You want to be the master. You want to be the one that takes control. So how do we gain the upper hand? How do we become the master? What I recommend, number one, is to read inspiring stories. I think that it can be very, very helpful when we read what others have done, how others live their life, righteous individuals. It's very inspiring. I'm right now in the middle of reading such a book about a great rabbi, a saint. And it's incredible how he was able to help people. But it's not just the help that he gave people, the miracles that he performed. It's how he reached such a high level of purity and righteousness. It's incredible. It's amazing. But it comes to show you that it's possible. It's not impossible. Obviously, we cannot always duplicate necessarily every single thing another righteous individual did. It may be too difficult for us or simply not relevant to us, but still, there's something that we can look up to here. A beautiful example of how he lived his life and how we perhaps should model all our life after him. So inspiring stories can be very helpful and I think that I would rather call it the medicine that people need here uh, to deal with all kinds of spiritual illnesses that they may have. Real powerful medicine, inspiring stories. Number two, people who have a habit of sinking into depression and being sad and feeling bad. Music does wonders. Good music, not Persian music. <laughs> not depressing music or sad music. Uplifting music. Uplifting. And there are uplifting music. There is such a thing as uplifting music. And of course, and that could be international. There's a lot of music out there that can make you feel good, change your mood, and uh, be very uplifting. From time to time, I'm telling you, I know this from experience, when people listen to good music, they actually feel better. All of a sudden, they feel motivated. All of a sudden, they feel good. They're excited. Another idea that could be very, very helpful is the verse says in the Shleit, when one has worries, he's facing some difficulty, he should talk it over with someone. Hopefully someone that has a lot of experience, someone that has a positive outlook, and someone who cares. Not that he wants your money and he's going to charge you $150 an hour for a consultation. One who really cares and wants to help you. Find someone, a close friend to talk to someone who understands you, someone who will listen to you. So all of this can be very, very helpful in dealing with challenges. If you want to gain the upper hand and be on top, and God forbid, not at the bottom. When, you, when one does want to succeed, and he has started with a good thought, and he is progressing, he has to remember that in order to stay on track, he will need motivation, determination, and perseverance. You have to be motivated, you have to be determined, you have to persevere because there's a lot of ups and downs. So these three, motivation, determination, perseverance, are always going to be important in order to continue something that you started, something that is good. 
Because otherwise, one day you'll, you'll be on top, the next day you'll be in the bottom. You want it to be continuous, so you have to be motivated and determined. The following are things that one has to be careful with. Very, very careful because they can actually destroy his plans. Number one, anger. When one is angry too often, he loses control. He destroys his relationships. And he, he distances himself from God. God hates people who are angry, always getting angry. Very, very careful with anger. Anger is one of the worst methods, one of the worst characteristics that can destroy anything that you may have gained. Number two, be careful not to harm anyone physically or financially, even though he may have harmed you too. People like to take revenge. People like to say, I'll see you in court. Or in some other way, hurt you in some way. Be careful. Why? Not only because it's wrong. I have a secret to tell you. What comes around goes around, they say in English. Lo que siembras, cosechas. And they say in Spanish, whatever you sow, you will harvest. There was you're hurting someone else, eventually it's going to come back to you. It's not a good idea. And number three, be careful not to curse. A lot of people have this weakness. I've noticed that they don't even realize what they're saying, what they're doing. The cursing, curse words, terrible. It brings out a terrible accusation against the individual from above. Be careful with your words, bad words. Curses is terrible. Okay. So now we've come to the final question. You've tried everything. Nothing seems to work. The changes are happening, perhaps slowly. What else are, are we missing here? So let me tell you, let me share with you a very important story. There was a famous rabbi in the 18th century. His name, his name was Rabbi Zusha. Rabbi Zusha was riding in a wagon together with the driver. This was a, a wagon that was full of hay. I guess he was getting a ride. And the wagon turned over. And the hay fell. So this wagon driver asks the rabbi, can you please help me put back the hay on the wagon? And the rabbi says, I can't. Because he, he wasn't so strong. And this driver tells him, Yes, you can, you just don't want to. Mm -hmm. The rabbi all of a sudden opened up his eyes and says, Wow, I just learned an important, important lesson in Judaism. Many, many times we could do something. Perhaps we don't want it enough. And upstairs they're going to be very upset at us. How come you didn't try harder? You know why you didn't try harder? Because you didn't want it enough. If you want something enough, you would try harder. So that leads us to, if there is a will, if there is a true will, you will find a way to do it. As long as it's reasonable, as long as it's realistic. Don't ever say, I'm weak, I can't do it. When it comes to a mitzvah, to a good deed, it will not be complete unless you try your hardest, unless you want it, you very much want it. And that is why there is a famous saying that people say, even though they don't know exactly what they're saying, that in the battle of so there's nothing that stands in the way of will. Now we know willpower is something very special, but what does it mean there's nothing that stands in the way of a will? If you will something, you're going to get it? There's nothing that stands in its way? That's impossible. We just said that there's all kinds of things that can stand in its way if he doesn't want it, if he doesn't approve it. So what does it mean? In the battle of Ratzon. So one rabbi said it very, very nicely. What Ratzon over here means is not necessarily our plans, our wishes, and our desire. It's the wanting something. You have to first want it. There's nothing stopping you from wanting, from thinking about it, from wanting to pursue it. That you should have. Nothing stands in the way of at least wanting to do something. I want to do something so special. I want to help. I want to be able to have a better relationship. You have to first want it. If somebody says he doesn't want it, 
and it's really something that he should want, there's a problem there. And that's what we need to recall at every moment where we face some difficulty. Do we really want to overcome it? Do we really want to deal with it? We will hopefully will be able to, with his help, of course. Therefore, what I suggest is really not my suggestion, but something that is emphasized very much in Hasidut, something that can help us greatly have the right attitude and have the right perspective and just have the right feeling about life and its challenges. And that thing that can help us with all of this is called Hit Bodedut. Hit Bodedut, I think we can translate as introspection. It's when you take a few moments of the day, late at night hopefully, late at night when it's quiet, when you won't be disturbed by a phone call or, or some noise, sit down in some corner of your choice and speak to him. That's what it's to do this. Hashem says, you can talk to me. You can speak to me as though I would be your friend. Yes, what's bothering you? What's on your mind? When one opens up like that and spills out his heart to Hashem, he will see wonders. He will see miracles. He will see another side of himself that he didn't recognize. He eventually will actually shed tears of remorse. He will eventually recognize all the good that Hashem has done with him. He will eventually hopefully see things differently than he has. Hopefully he will not be upset, disappointed, depressed, as long as he believes that Hashem is listening to him. And you know what? The more you do so, and the more you turn to Hashem and speak to him openly, one of these days, Besat Hashem, he will answer you.